this is about mobile phone photography and how you can use products like the Perfect Photo Suite to get the most out of it. Now, I use an Apple iPhone 4. That's my phone. Uh, I've had it since the day it was released. I love it. I love the camera on it. That is not to say that this webinar is exclusive to iPhone 4 or iPhone or Apple users. Um, basically, if your phone has a camera, you know, you fit into this uh, demographic. And these days, it's almost harder to find a phone without a camera than with a camera. Without the first and most important rule, the webinar is kind of moot for you. You have to get your photos off of your phone. What I personally do is, on my, on my production machine, I um, use Lightroom. And I import, if you connect your phone, or at least the iPhone, to your computer, when you go to import in Lightroom, it'll detect the phone as a source, a photo source. And so I select my phone. I have a separate catalog just for my iPhone photos. And, um, and I import them into a catalog, so I have them off of my phone. This it serves several purposes. First and foremost, it allows me to actually um, work on the images. But second, it also just adds a second layer of backup. Uh, you know, that way I have another copy of it on my computer. And uh, Andrew brings up a good question: Is this the same as is this the same camera as the iPod Touch 4? That I'm not sure of. I know the iPhone 4 has a five megapixel camera. I don't know what the latest iPod Touch has. Uh, I would recommend going to uh, Apple's website to compare the the stats. So I broke down very basically. Um, what I consider to be editing on a phone versus a computer. Now, if you're an Android user, if you're a, an iPhone user, there's no shortage of apps that you can download, that you can buy to do all kinds of cool uh, edits on your phones. And, you know, they're actually pretty good. Uh, I have a tilt shift uh, generator app. I have Hipstamatic, which is probably my most used application. Um, Photoshop, even Adobe has a free version of Photoshop for the iPhone <clears throat> and for Android, which allows you to do you know basic corrections like add contrast or saturation, um, some basic effects. So accessing it on your phone is obviously accessible, meaning the phone's in your pocket or in your hand, you can edit your images. It's a quick solution and it's inexpensive. On average, these products are either free or they cost somewhere between 99 cents and probably $2.99 US. Um, but they're limited in functionality. You know, you, you, clearly there's only so much that a uh, developer will build into their uh, mobile phone software. Uh, the quality can actually degrade the image. So sometimes when I, I've taken an image with my camera and I put it through one of these products, it actually makes the image quality worse. Um, so that that's something to consider, and, and also there's no, there's a lack of fine control, uh, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the limited functionality. It's just the way it is. Now, conversely, working on a computer, obviously, it's a, you have access to the most powerful tools that we have. You know, you can use Photoshop, you can use Lightroom, uh, you can use the Perfect Photo Suite, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you have much greater quality control, meaning a lot of times my iPhone images are very susceptible to noise, and that's just simply because even that five megapixel camera is cramming those five megapixels onto a very, very tiny sensor. And that's tip, that is one of the culprits for noise. It's, it's the same reason why I, I always laugh when like Canon or Nikon or anyone would release these little pocket cameras, these tiny little things with like 15 megapixels. Total overkill. Because you're cramming all of these pixels into a sensor size that's very small. And what that does is it builds up heat, it adds, um, uh, noise and it just degrades your image quality. In fact, Canon did that from the I think the G11 to the G12. They dropped their megapixels, or it was from the it was either from the G10 to the G11 or the G11 to the G12. But they went backwards in megapixel count because the image quality suffered so much. So um, you can, with the noise that you get introduced there on a computer, you can run noise reduction filters that are much more powerful than anything you can find on a phone, and it addresses the phone limitations. But a computer can be expensive, the software can be expensive, uh, and you have a learning curve. So to do a lot of these things, you know, it's not as easy as using your finger as your 
control device and just clicking, uh, you know, dragging a slider or pressing an effect like you would on a phone. You actually have to know how to do this stuff. Gary brings up a point that his Droid X has an 8 megapixel camera. Um, that goes to my point of having more megapixels is not always the best thing. My, uh, my very close friend has a Droid X as well. Um, and the images, he, at least his images, they do, some of them do suffer from that over megapixelization. Um, and Joyce, I can recommend applications. Um, as far as how to use them, I can't do that because there's no way for me to show you through the webinar program my phone. Um, and Nancy's saying, if Lightroom is a backup, where else are you saving to? Um, when I back up my, when I import my images into li my iPhone Light Lightroom catalog, the images and that catalog get backed up to the hard drive every night. Like I have, that's it's part of my backup solution that I do with my regular photos. Just because my images were taken on my phone, um, don't think that they're any less important to me uh, than my images taken with my 5D Mark II. They're just as important. So let's actually go here and so. What I did here was the images that I chose for this webinar, we're going to go into some new ones, but I'll also use one or two probably from the previous webinar. These images, um, I tried to kind of select a baseline of images that um, probably could apply to the majority of people out there. So this first image here, nothing special. This is one of my dogs. Uh, her name is Chaka, and this is in my backyard. It's the kind of shot that I think anyone could take, and that's great. That's 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 not a problem. Um, but if we zoom in, you know, clearly we've got some blown highlights. You can see some noise in the background over here. I'm just going to wait for it to catch up. Uh, and the background itself, because of all that blown out information, is I find it very distracting. So what we can do is let's actually bring this into Photoshop and let's start working on it. And now because I took the, the photo off my phone, I can actually just use products here that um, will make it better. So usually one of the first things I do, guys, is I'll go into Photoshop and I'll use this, um, the, my healing brush, and I'll just start painting out um, things like these leaves that are I find distracting. I'm very, very kind of anal about those things, um, especially around the subject. So my subject is my dog, and I'm just kind of getting rid of small things. The brush that I'm using is this kind of content-aware uh, healing brush. It's part of CS5. It's called the Spot Healing Brush, and it does a really nice job of kind of sampling pixels around the area that I draw. Now, this right here is something you you just can't do on a phone you don't have that flexibility so what we're able to do here is really clean up an image now what we can do is let's actually take this image and we'll go into photo tools and let's kind of stylize it a bit um, so we know that there's a lot of foliage here and there's a really cool preset if you do a search or not foliage I should say there's a lot of grass there's this foliage in the background but um, if you do a search for the word green there's a cool preset called um, green enhancer so any of you guys that are taking shots in forests or like golf courses this does a really nice job of kind of only addressing the green channel and so you can see if we bring it up to a hundred percent it actually it, it uh, boosts the quality of the grass but it doesn't make it overly saturated it's actually it's one of my favorite at but one of my most underutilized effects in photo tools it's called green enhancer um, and then on top of that, what I might do is go under the uh, categories section. Then we can go into the image optimized. So with photo tools, we have our effects broken down into categories. And there is no real, so the categories themselves, we tried to be as self-explanatory as possible. So black and white treatments are black and white effects. Um, portrait enhance are typically effects that you would use on a portrait. But we have a little over 300 effects. It's hard to kind of necessarily categorize every effect you know into something that's logical so under the image optimize the reason why I bring this up is we've got this effect called the local contrast boost now this doesn't necessarily optimize your image uh, but it does a nice job of at high strength it's awful so when it comes in here you see it's kind of 
it's really awful. Um, and that's because it is giving way too much of local contrast boost. I've used this effect to bring back texture and I use it usually, I never go above 10%. I just want a, a tiny bit of a, of a texture boost. Now what I'm going to do is I want to kind of bring focus to Chaka's head because the rest of this image is kind of boring. Um, I like the fact that I framed her over here. That's good um, as opposed to dead center. And I was, I was definitely, uh, I was kneeling down at the time. Um, so the first thing, there are several ways that you can draw a, a viewer's eye to a particular part of the frame. The first is using, you know, light and dark. And so if we go to the lighting effect here, and we go to this dynamic light effect, and you see this little bug next to it, I'm going to use an effect called uh, light, uh, actually we'll do dark round, and we'll add it to the stack. Now watch what we're going to do. You see this little bug over here? Anything inside the bug is dark, and anything outside is light. Now, this is kind of like the focus bug in focal point. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to position it over Chaka's head. I'll put it right here. And I actually missed my dog Chaka. My, uh, my wife took the two dogs to her family's for the weekend, for the long holiday weekend. I have to stay here because we, uh, we're, we put our house on the market. And so someone needs to be here for the open house. So I'm looking at my dog and I'm missing her, which is kind of a bummer, but that's okay. Um, my point here is so you see how we have the mask on Chaka's head and her head is darker? Watch what happens. If I hit this invert mask button, it essentially reverses the, the um, effect. Now, this is a bit too abrupt of a, of a transition from the light to the dark. It's a bit too obvious. So I always recommend starting at zero and just kind of slowly bringing it up. So you get, you're starting to get a nice kind of transition, almost like a custom vignette around the Chaka's head. Everything else is kind of dark, and if you go to your show mask, you can see this mask. This, so everything in gray is kind of dark. Now here's the cool thing. You know, watch, as we bring it up, it goes to white. So as in true mask form, anything that's pure white will reveal anything in black will hide. So here everything is hidden the effect is hidden. So that's kind of a way to interpret our masks. So let's bring that down here. And so we don't want to go too crazy. We don't need to go that crazy. We're going to hit apply and let photo frame do or photo tools do its thing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into focal point because I want to bring the focus to Chaka's face even more, but I want to do it in a very subtle way. So let me actually reset our settings in focal point. So here again, just like in Photo Tools, we have a bug, except in Photo Tools, the bug controlled where the effect is applied. Here in Focal Point, the bug controls where your focus and blur are applied. So anything inside the bug is in focus and anything outside is out of focus. So if we put the, the focus bug around Chaka's head, and just kind of get it positioned. It doesn't have to be too, too... Um, uh, exact. Once we have a kind of position, the first thing I usually do is I'll se select a lens to emulate. So here I've got um, these lenses, and these are built into focal point. So I'm going to select one that's kind of wide, like this 35 and 1.4, and changes the overall characteristics of the blur. Now I'm going to drop the blur amount significantly, because you don't need that much blur. Once you start uh, at dropping the amount, you start to see the kind of um, what's happening with the transition around her head. And if you want to have a smoother transition, bring your feathering up. The feathering will create um, a, a kind of a gradual transition from the in focus area to the out of focus area. That's what a feather is. Now, what we can do is we can use our focus brush. So this brush right here is a focus brush. I'm going to make sure that I'm set to paint focus. I'm going to bring my opacity up about a little more than halfway. And I'm going to start painting on certain areas of Chaka's face that are out of focus just to snap them back in. And what that's doing is it's allowing me to ensure that these areas here are in focus. So you can see now that we're starting to get um, a nice 
uh, direction for the viewer. And if it's still too much, you can drop the amount down even more. So here we can kind of bring it down maybe to even like six. Really subtle, very, very subtle. But now her face is popping out, and that's what I want. What I can also do is drop the brightness. The brightness and the contrast affect everything that's out of focus. So you can see how everything but Chaka's face is getting darker. And I can boost the contrast because that's also going to aid in bringing your eye towards the focal point. And finally, we can add a little bit of a vignette. And the, now that I'm looking at it, I kind of want to have her the bottom part of her collar in focus. So just painting in a little bit. So it doesn't look like her head is massive. That's looking a little bit better. We're making a nice transition from the top of her head through the through her the, the bottom part of her mouth and down her shoulders. And if you want, you know, to paint focus in a much smaller amount, just drop the opacity of your focus brush. So if you drop it way down, you can kind of paint in focus at very, very small increments. Now we can hit apply and let a focal point do its thing. So here's um, our original image. And then this is photo tools just to stylize it a bit. And then focal point to finish it up. Now I saw a good question earlier. Um, what size prints can you get with the iPhone? Joyce asked that. Well, this is where something like perfect resize really is uh, works its magic. So it's a five megapixel camera. Perfect resize is, um, those of you that may not be familiar with perfect resize might be familiar with uh, what perfect resize used to be, and that was genuine fractals. Um, so perfect resize is the next generation of genuine fractals. So you can see when the image comes in, it's about eight by 10. You can see the units right here. Now let's say we want to boost this up. Let's try, let's go to photographic. So under the document size panel, there are these presets. And if you click down, you have these various categories. And I pretty much always go to photographic because these are where you'll find the most common print sizes. So let's go up to like 30 by 40. So at 30 by 40, this is a 398%, almost a 400% uh, increase in size. So what we'll do is let's go to a one-to-one -one view, meaning we're going to zoom in one-to-one. -one. I want to see what the quality looks like. So right off the bat, this is looking like we've zoomed in too far. So let me zoom in just let me zoom out just a little bit because it's kind of hard to see here. That's good. So at 400 um, percent, this is actually excellent. The detail that you have in oops, I messed up my uh, my crop box. Okay, and I'll just go here zoom. Oh, but it changed my, I see, it changed my, uh, let me change my preset back to this, to 24 by, 30 by 40. And then what you'll want to do after you set your preset is you want to set your resolution. This is very important. If you're putting this image, let's say you want to bring, put this image out to the web, you don't need um, 240 pi uh, pixels per inch. I would drop it down to 72 or 100. Um, but if you're printing it out to paper, you'll always want to ask your uh, printer your lab what they recommend usually 300 to 360 is more than enough so here we're at 240 and again if we zoom in here we're at a four to one view we can keep zooming in I just want to zoom in a little bit more but now the point is that, so here we're, we're at a one, this is a one-to-one -one view. Um, and this is a great way to see um, what quality you'll get. The other nice thing is, let's say, let's just bring this back out to uh, 11 by 14, for instance. So this is 100%, um, this is 146% increase. 11 by 14 is, an, is the, the print size of 11 by 14 is different than the actual dimensions of your camera sensor. So what you can do is you see how you have Im, 
a crop box you can see above and below the crop box it's slightly gray that means that you can reposition your this uh, crop box to what you want to appear in your print and it'll always print at 11 by 14 for some reason my my uh, my Wacom tablet my pen is really jerky and it's causing my crop box to move around but that's neither here nor there. One other feature that I'd like to show you in perfect resize, let's say you want to print this, let's say you want to print this as a canvas. So you see how Chaka's paw is right by the edge of the frame. Also this paw is kind of close to the edge of the frame. The way canvases work, if you could picture it, is that <clears throat> the print is stretched around wooden stretcher bars. So it's possible that when this is printed, this part of the print will stretch around and it'll impact your composition. But with this galley wrap function, which you see here on the right, if you turn it on, what Perfect Resize will do is it'll automatically sample from the inside of the composition. Now this is off because, let's drop down the galley wrap for a second, I want to make my document larger. Because it's so small, it's sampling more information. There, that's, that's basically what I wanted to show you. You can see how Perfect Resize keeps the original composition and it samples. It doesn't actually stretch and remove it from the front uh, window. So you see exactly what... And that's a really cool feature of um, Perfect Resize. <clears throat> Hassel is asking, if, is, this a, um, is this soft proofing the film? or the print. No, not, I wouldn't call this necessarily soft proofing um, because we haven't done anything with matching the images to the uh, printer's color, uh, the printer's um, color profiles for their printer. Um, that's more like soft proofing because we're not, we're not studying color over here. Um, we're studying just kind of the overall quality of the enlargement. So that this right here is a 357% enlargement. Um, soft proofing would be you want to make sure that you um, you download say your the ICC profile or the printer profile of your lab um, and apply that to see what it looks like on your screen that's kind of soft proofing oh the detailing well that's more so if we go back into perfect resize you can do, apply certain things like um, sharpening. Texture control is more, texture control is kind of the opposite of, sh of sharpening. Texture control is more like if you want to smooth out your image. When you use sharpening, I always recommend being at a one-to-one -one view. And now we've got these three different m methods. Unsharp mask is what you'll find in Photoshop. High pass is good if you um, have hard edges and my favorite is progressive and then all you need to do is just kind of tweak the amount and you can see I don't know if you can see it over the internet but as I bring up the amount of progressive uh, the part that's in focus is getting even more in focus these highlight and shadow sliders will allow you to protect the highlights in the shadows of the image from the uh, sharpening so here if we really crank it up it'll get over sharpened so you don't want that. You kind of want to avoid that. Kind of, you see how it kind of gets really, really crispy? We don't want that. The key, though, guys, is if you're going to sharpen, always be at this one-to-one. -one. Because that's where it's the same thing in Lightroom. You always want to be zoomed in when you're sharpening. So here we're going to drop that down. We don't need that much sharpening. Poor Chaka. Okay. So that was just one example. <clears throat> of how I was able to take um, a standard image that I took with my with my iPhone. Let's go to and get into some more uh, funkier stuff. So I, got, I have this image here. Nothing special. I took this actually just a couple of weeks ago. I took the two, my two dogs to the dog park and there was this cool tree. And I have this thing for some reason with trees. I don't know what it is. I just like shooting trees, especially when it's got this cool hard light on it. Go figure. But this is the kind of shot that anyone can do. I just pointed my camera up, and I, the, my key was I want to make sure that the tree came to the bottom, to one of the corners. 
just for, for composition. So let's send this to Photoshop and let's do some stuff with it. How you, let's show you how you can take an ordinary regular image of a tree and make it pretty, pretty cool. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go into photo tools. When I see these kinds of trees, the first thing I think about is black and white. That's, I mean, instantly I think of, I want this to be a very cool black and white. So we can go to the black and white treatments here. And in photo tools 26, we built this new uh, black and white effect called Mac G black and white. I'm going to apply the cool setting here and we'll add the stack. And so right off the bat, I'm happy with what I'm seeing here. This is looking pretty cool. It's getting a little bit more drama. The next uh, black, I'm going to add another black and white effect called, uh, let's try Kev's secret formula. Yeah, that's looking good, except I don't like it that strong. You see how it kind of you're losing that sharpness? So let's drop it to zero and just bring it up a bit. Because I do like, it, it introduces a little bit of a kind of a, a nuttiness, a nutty, nutty brown tint to the, to the image. And to combat that, I'm going to go to my tinting treatments. I'm going to go to the first one here, tint with clean whites, and select this little light blue uh, swatch to add that in there. And I'm going to—it's almost looking like somewhat of a cross-processed look. Okay, so we've got that. We can hit apply to let the change render. All right, there's that. Now you can see, if I zoom in, guys, you see this. Let me wait for the screen to catch up. There we go. You see this um, noise in the sky. So this is a product of the iPhone. I mean, it's just the way it is. We could, I have a, pro, the, I have a noise reduction filter here by Topaz called uh, Denoise 5. It's what I use for my uh, images. And so usually I'll do, this is a JPEG image, iPhone photos are JPEG, so I'll use the JPEG um, moderate preset. And I like, it does a pretty good job of softening the sky. So I'm going to hit OK. I want it, I'm going to let it apply to the entire image, just because I, the noise is bothering me. I'd rather add texture in than um, have the noise do it for me, if that makes any sense. Okay, so this did a really nice job. It probably, I, I hope you guys can actually see the difference it made. It made a really nice difference for me, and this could be my ignorance, um, or maybe I'm missing a, a, a setting or a preference. I can't stand when something like a noise reduction filter doesn't create a new layer. It is in the history. You can see right here in the history that we've got the noise reduction, but it's attached to my photo tools layer. So if I want to say drop the opacity of that, I can't unless I make a duplicate layer and then run the noise reduction filter. So I hope Topaz fixes that. Unless I, unless I, um, I'm missing something. Uh, yeah, Nancy, I could zoom in. So you should be able to see that the sky is a lot nicer. There is still a little bit of remnant noise, which I'm fine with, but um, overall, it's much better. Uh, actually, we can go here to the history. I'll take a step back. So do you see how that noise came in? And then if we come back, it kind of softens out. And it, it, one thing to, to point out with noise reduction, you don't want that much noise reduction. You know how sometimes, the way I kind of relate it is you see a portrait of a model and their skin looks like plastic or porcelain. Um, while that's not noise reduction, that's actually kind of adding like a Gaussian blur in a way. It was done too much, and it looks way too soft. I'm okay with a little bit of noise. Now let's do this. I wonder how many of you out there realize that you, you can use your phone to get an amazing library of textures. I just pulled a few of my the ones I've taken recently, and textures can be anything. A texture is anything that is, that is not smooth. Or even it could be somewhat smooth with a somewhat of a cool color if or, or a, a patina or some rust. But here, I, um, I was in a taxi going to San Antonio uh, for the Imaging USA Expo with On One earlier this year, and it was raining. And so I'm going to show you at the end of the webinar, I have these little add-on lenses for my, for my uh, 
iPhone, and they're compatible with, I think, any mobile phone. I can take these little lenses and stick them onto my camera. One will give me a fisheye uh, look. One will give me a macro. This is the macro. I wish you could be, you know, be there with me right now. My camera is probably an inch and a half away from the from the window, the car window. It is right there. You can see if we zoom in, like all the gross crud of of the um, window. So you can see this is um this is a I was walking with my wife to dinner, and I saw this building and it had a cool wall. This is one of the tiles of the walls. Just took a picture of it. Nothing special. Same thing here. This is a, a garage door. And then I brought it even closer, and this is a close-up view of the garage door. Uh, yeah, Regina, I will. Sh I, not only will I mention it, I'll actually bring up the link um, where you can where, and I'll show you where to get it. By all means, I'll definitely do that. And let me just see. I see a few. Oh, John asks an interesting question. From a workflow perspective, would it be better to copy the JPEG to a TIFF first? Um, you know, I've never heard that every time you open a JPEG, it's degraded. I don't think that's the case. Um, I personally, I don't do that. When I work with my HDR images or my Canon images, you know, like the the higher megapixel images, I work in uh, DNG, which is Adobe's raw format. Um, and then I convert to TIFF when I use um, Photoshop. But no, I, I just use JPEGs here, and they're they're fine. So we've got this image here, and a bunch of questions just came in. I'll uh, I'll uh, get these questions for a se in a second. What I want to do now is I want to show you that in Lightroom. Let's take a texture here. So you see this image here. It's basically a cross section of this metal. I just brought the camera closer and got this. So let's go here and let's bring it into Photoshop. Someone else is concurrent. Who? John, I see that um, Trevor's concurring with you that JPEGs degrade. If they do, guys. Um, I don't know. It to me, it's. Uh, I wonder where the point of diminishing returns is to to uh, to upscale or upconvert to a TIFF, even if it's an 8-bit TIFF. I guess it depends. Um, I don't work in JPEG normally. I only convert to JPEG for webinars or if I have an iPhone shot. All right. So we've got this image. What we're gonna do is let's go to image adjustments and let's just or actually mode and let's go to uh, grayscale. I just want to get rid of the, all the color information. Now you can see that our that image here is vertical. This image here is horizontal. So I'm going to I'm going to go to image, image rotation. I'm just going to rotate it 90 degrees. Then I'm going to go to select all to make a selection around the image. I don't think I did it actually. There we go. And I'm going to hit my move tool, and I'm going to drag the image from this tab to the tab with my tree image. Now before I let go, here's an important point. I'm going to press and hold the shift key. Watch what happens if I press and hold the shift key. Or actually, let's do this without a shift key. I press it in, and the image just kind of drops in there, and it's, it's not what I want. So I'm going to undo that. I'm going to go back to this image. I'm going to drag it again, except this time I'm going to hold the shift key when I let go. It actually snaps on top of the image. So that's an important kind of little quick tip. Now, what we have here is we've got our uh, photo tools image with our texture overlay. What we can do now is go through these various blending modes. And you know what? Why 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 are we doing this? Let's let's um let's let's do this. Actually, let's um yep, yeah, let's delete this. Let's save this. Why are we doing it in Photoshop when we have perfect layers that we can do this in? Close this out. Make sure we have the image. There's our image in Lightroom. Let's go to our texture over here. Um, the fourth one is the one I want to use. I'm going to rotate it. So let's go to R. We'll angle. We'll uh, rotate it. 
Oh, wait. I know what I want to do. That's what I want. That's fine. Uh, let's go to our saturation and desaturate it. Okay, so there's my texture. Let's go to the whole catalog here. So we'll take this image and that image and we'll go to File, Plugin Extras, Perfect Layers. Now let's send it to Perfect Layers. Let's hit Close. Okay, so the first thing we're, we're going to want to do is with this active layer, you can see this is perfect layers for you guys. It's This is our newest product. We just released it today. Um, just like Photoshop, we've got a layers palette. You can hide the layers. You can rename a layer, so we can say this is texture. This is image. And now what we can do is um, I can go to my texture layer. I can go to my uh, move tool, and we can kind of... Just it's a like a free transform. Just kind of stretch it over. Now, what we can do is we can go through these various blending modes, and so we can start seeing how we're blending, finding one that we like. And so I actually kind of like this overlay one. Now, there are a few things we can do. First, if there's if this texture is too strong for you, we can drop the opacity of that texture. So make it a little bit less faint. The other thing that we can do is we can use a masking brush and make sure that we're set to paint out. And let's say we don't want that texture on the tree. We can paint it out of the tree. Now the cool thing is that if you want to see where you're painting, you can go to the show mask button and select overlay. So you can see exactly where you're drawing your mask. That's, you, you also have an option of showing it as white, or you can show it as our historical mask, the black and white. I like the overlay the most. This is one of the most welcome features I can I could ask for. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, drop the opacity of my brush, and I'm going to just paint out a little bit here. Just a little bit, so that... Um, we kind of don't have that pattern everywhere. Drop it down even more and just kind of paint it up here. So you can see now what we're able to do with perfect layers is kind of just take two different files and now if we hit file save, check this out. We'll go to file save. It's going to save this PSD file. It appears in Lightroom, so there's our image. Now check this, this is the cool part. If we go to right click, go to edit in, and bring it back to Photoshop, let's edit the original. There are our two layers with the titles, texture and image. There's our layer mask that we were painting. And now if there's a certain if a filter that you want to apply that is not in perfect layers, uh, you can do so. But for the the most common uses of Photoshop that we found are layer masking and layer blending and we've given that to you in a really really fast product so that's two different images taken with my phone pretty cool um, <clears throat> okay And Peter, Peter wants to know how does Perfect Layers differ from Photoshop. I strongly recommend, Peter, you join our webinar later today where we, we're going to spend our, the entire time in Perfect Layers. But primarily, Perfect Layers is um, a, our newest product, product that gives you a layered workflow solution in Lightroom. So you don't need to go into Photoshop. You don't need to pick up Photoshop if you're looking to take multiple images and merge them together or to blend them uh, or do composites. Uh, Perfect layers is pretty perfect, actually. All right, let's do one more. Let's see here. I was going to do Mask Pro here, but I kind of like this one better. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to send this into Photoshop right now. So this is an image that I took uh, outside of my buddy's office in Manhattan. He has he owns a production studio. 
He was on the seventh floor in Midtown. I kind of stuck my the, my upper torso out of the window and I shot down. The reason why I did that is because I know that by doing this, I can recreate a tilt shift look. I can recreate a miniature kind of toy model look here with my iPhone. Now, how do we do that? Well, let's first, um, let me think, do I want to first, do, yeah, let's do that first. Let's go into focal point and I'll show you how to cre create that kind of miniature toy model look and then we'll actually change the look of the image. So I'm going to reset my settings and you can see again, here's our round bug put it down over here. I'm going to change the shape from round to planar. So now the bug is went from circle to square. I'm going to make the mat, the focus bug horizontal and I'm going to put it right over the people on the sidewalk. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to change the perspective of the blur. And to do that, you have to put your cursor inside the body of the bug. So here's the body, the square. And then uh, you, uh, if you're on a Mac, you'll hit the Option key, and if you're on the PC, you'll hit the Alt key. So I'm pressing the Option key because I'm on a Mac, and I'm going to tilt up. And you can see how that perspective is changing, and I made it basically parallel to the sidewalk. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the amount of blur a little bit, and I'm going to drop my feathering a, bit, a little bit. And so you can see now that as I kind of make this a little bit wider, and I'm going to bring my feathering up a bit, to, you can see how they're almost, they're almost now looking like toy models. They're looking like little figurines. We can further bring attention by dropping brightness and boosting contrast. We can also increase the highlight bloom to pop the specular highlights in the autofocus areas. See here, it's a matter of just kind of playing around with the amount of blur. Drop my feathering down a little bit more. So what I'll do now is I'll take my focus brush and I'll refine my selection. So I'm going to bring my focus brush up and I'm going to make sure that like this little sign here is in focus. The top of this parking sign is in focus. I want to make sure all my people are in focus. I want to make sure that the sidewalk and the graffiti are in focus. And so I'm just kind of drawing along the edge here. Because it's important that you control what's in focus. Like that person was not in focus and I brought them in. Same thing with this lamppost. This lamppost is on the plane of focus. So you want to make sure that you paint that in. Just so you get kind of a good representation of in focus and out of focus. Now we can hit apply and now we can go into photo tools and really give it a very cool look. So what I'm going to do now is go into photo tools and I'm going to apply a black and white effect that we used just before called Kev Seeker formula. I'm going to add it to the stack and I love what it does here. For some reason, when I first tried this effect, I, the first thing that came to my mind was the movie Inception. I don't know why, but it just kind of this gave me a feeling like I was watching that, uh, the movie Inception. Um, now, what I can do here is I'm going to use my masking brush, and I'm going to select Paint Out, and I'm going to drop the opacity to about 75%, and I'm going to paint back the original colors of the people because I think they look very cool um, in color against this very drab background, especially this, the people here who are wearing blue jeans. So here, if you paint out side of the person, just change the paint in and just kind of paint that back in, the, the effect. And so now they're just kind of like looking like they're walking back and forth. I, I, I don't know what it is. I love this image. What I might also do is uh, go back to my lighting effects and use that same dynamic light, except here I'm going to do light and planar. And that'll give me a planar bug that I can kind of put over the sidewalk to really brighten them up and set them apart. Again, I could drop the strength of that and just bump it just a bit. But here was our original. And here's what we have now. Looks pretty cool, I, I think. Um, 
And if you want, you can kind of toy around with, uh, if we go back to the kept secret formula, we can kind of restore, oh, we have to paint it out. If you want color in the parking signs, it's up to you how you want it. Here, I, I actually kind of paint it out on the sidewalk, so I have to get rid of that. But that's looking kind of cool. I think there's also a little color in this sign here. But it, it just, it, it's fun. It's a fun shot taken with my little iPhone. So we can hit apply. And there we go. We can add an adjustment layer. Sometimes I'll go to the adjustments layer, oh, adjustment layers and add a levels layer just to kind of boost the white and the black points a bit. And then let me see. Yeah, I kind of like that. So there you go. That's kind of how you're able to just use the, the, the perfect photo suite with what you already have. And so that's what I've got. Let me go through questions because I think we'll end it here. I want to make sure if there are any questions. Oh, and I'll show you where the, I got the lenses. I'll show you that in a second. <clears throat> oh, okay. Paul brings up a good point. When we were talking earlier about JPEGs uh, being degraded, I agree with Paul. Uh, Paul says that opening and closing JPEGs doesn't degrade, but saving the JPEG could degrade it. That's true. That's absolutely true, because watch. If I go here and I go to File, Save As, and I change this to a JPEG, and I'll just save it to the desktop. If I hit Save, you have this option here in Photoshop uh, to choose the quality of your JPEG. Now, so Photoshop gives you this option. A lot of uh, products don't. So it is very possible that when you save it, you're saving it at a, at a lower quality. So, to that point, absolutely, I agree with you 100%. Um, depending on the the sort or the destination of this, um, I'll adjust. You know, if if it's something that I'm giving a proof to a client, I'll drop it way low. But if it's something that I'm going to be putting out, I'll bring it up maximum. So there's that. Um, I kind of want to save this for my because I want to use this on my blog, but I, I'm going to redo it because I did a sloppy job drawing. But that I love I love this shot. I, I do really enjoy it a lot. Um, what I might do is, I wonder if we could do this. Um, this can be this can blow up in our faces, guys. But let's just see. Let's just see. Okay. Let's say I select with my lasso tool this part of this guy. Then we go to filter. Um, oh, I'm on the. I need to go on this layer here. That's why. Filter, um, blur, radial. Oops, not shape blur. Filter, blur, radial blur, zoom, and the guy's walking this way. So we're going to put our zoom to the right, and we'll hit OK. Did it do anything? I don't think it did anything. Maybe it's because I... Oh, you know what? Let's just... when it, To err on the side of caution, I'm just going to stamp this layer. Now let's do it again. Filter, radial blur. doesn't look like it did anything. Let me bring up the blur amount. Because what I want to do is give them the sense of motion, like they're moving. Um, radial blur, let's bring it up to 22. It's not doing anything, which is weird. Unless I'm not seeing it. No, I don't think, I don't know why it's not happening. I made my selection. This is going to bother me now, guys. I only want that part of them to move. Well, let's go to filter radio blur. Zoom in. Let me do this. On. Oh, it is happening. Okay, it's just really, really subtle. Hmm, that's a bummer. Let me go back out here. So let's see if we kind of go here and let's bring it up big time. Blur, radio blur, and then like 57. I guess it kind of gives him a sense of motion. Um, so 
yeah. There was a question, how did I create that stamp? Um, one of our frequent um, webinar attendees, her name is Candice, she showed me how to get to it from within um, the menus because it's not in the menus. You can't, no matter what you do, as far as I know, you it's not something, the command is called stamp visible. So you could see right there stamp visible. What stamp visible does is it'll take every visible layer and it'll create a new layer without merging them. It's a great way to create a snapshot. It's one of the best commands in Photoshop. To get to it, if I remember correctly, let's go back here before we stamped it. Deselect. All right. So I want to create a I want to create a a new layer that takes all of these layers but without merging them. If you go to layer and then go to merge visible and then hit the is it the option key on a Mac or the alt key on a PC? Yep. So it's you have to go to the layer, go to merge visible and press the option key on a Mac or the alt key on a PC when clicking. And that'll create your stamped layer. Now, a point to make is if one of these layers is hidden and you stamp it, it will not take that layer into consideration. So just remember that. Yeah, and Hassler's bringing up the, <laughs> the reason why I don't want to give you the, the um, keyboard shortcut is because it's, I call it the claw. So this is the, um, this is the keyboard shortcut on a Mac first. And I'll make it larger. It's control plus option plus shift plus E and on a PC, it's command, uh, oh, not control, sorry, I'm getting my PC and my Mac, command. On a PC, it's control plus alt plus shift plus E. So if you kind of make that, that, that position on your keyboard, it looks like a claw. So let me make these larger for you guys to see. Oops. It's much easier to go into the menu here, go to image, hit the alt, or rather the layer on merge visible, hit the alt or option key and do the same thing. <clears throat> so um, <laughs> it's the best, it's one of the most used commands. I agree with you, Hassler. It's, it's very important to me. Okay, let's wrap, oh no, 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 no. Let me show you where to get the lenses. <laughs> I'm also gonna paint uh, paste the URL to where I got my lenses in the chat module. So if you have your chat module in your control panel, you'll see it pop up. So the place that I go to is called Photo Jojo, photojojo.com. Then you go to the Photo Jojo store, and it's right here. And I'll copy this and put it into the chat module. So you guys should see that. Just confirm if you see that in your chat module for for me, if you don't mind. Um, but it, there are two different lenses. There's the um, there's the, this combo wide angle and macro. So this is the macro lens I was telling you about. And then there's also a fisheye. That's the fisheye lens. And it does such a wonderful, this is basically how close you get. No joke, you get right up on there with the macro. So the two lens, the, the two sets, both of these together is 40 US dollars. Um, and then Separately, it's 45. I have both of these, and they're awesome. I also have this one, which is a huge disappointment. Biggest disappointment ever. I was so excited for it. Where is it? It's a, it's a telephoto lens. Oh, there it is. And it's crazy, because it, it comes with a specific case and a tripod and the zoom lens, but it's garbage. which is a bummer. Are these lenses for the iPhone? No. Um, technically, they're for any phone. So like that one there, that zoom lens, that's iPhone only. These, what you get is you get this little magnetic sticker. Um, it's a little, if you can see behind the lens, there's a little adhesive that you put around the, your camera lens. So any phone that has it. Um, I wish they had a picture of it. That's the kind of backing of it. 
you remove the plate and then there's a magnet and it sticks on. And you get, um, I think, two magnets. Oh, you can see it right here. You see that little circle? That's the magnetic uh, sticker. You can use it for the iPod Touch, absolutely. You can. Uh, can you take it off easily? Yep, you can take it off easily. I I wouldn't recommend it. Meaning, oh, wait, Nancy, are you talking about taking the lens off or the sticker off? <clears throat> yeah, Bob brings up a good. I was wondering about that. Bob says he got his for his iPhone 3GS, and the 3GS is curved at the top. This is actually they're showing your 3GS over here. So sometimes you do see the you'll get like the vignette of the lens itself, which is a bummer. The iPhone 4 is flat on the back. The lens is easy to come off, but it's, it, does a, it has a good hold on it. So it's not like you have to worry about it when, when it's on. This is kind of what Bob's talking about. You see how the iPhone 4 is curved, or the 3? So you want to be careful with that. <clears throat> you have a 1G iPhone. So you've got the iPhone. <laughs> no 3G, no 3GS, no 4. Upgrade. The 4 is amazing. And the 5 won't come out anytime soon. So, uh, Will this seminar be available again? Yeah, that's a good way. Thank you very much for that little uh, segue, Deb. 